I would like to welcome to the stage someone who made a huge impact on my life. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, Mr. John Gossman, who's the lead architect uh, for Azure. John, come on out. Hi, John. There's your clicker. Now I'm going to be tempted to talk really, really fast for a while. So I want to thank you all for having me here today. This is uh, my fourth, fifth Chef Conf. I've been coming here since 2013. It's probably my favorite conference because of all the energy and enthusiasm that the Chef team and the entire community brings to the event. And I love the Chef message of organizational transformation in order to make businesses move faster. And so today, I'm here to talk to you about how open source is changing Microsoft. Now, to give you some perspective, I want to tell a little bit about myself and what I do. I'm an architect in the Azure core team. And what you can do is you can think of the Azure core team as we're the team that writes the basic software that runs the Microsoft Cloud. So this is all sorts of things. I mean, we build firmware for NICs and routers. And we design the basic compute network and storage fabric that underlies all the other services in uh, Azure. And then the team is also responsible for some, some very basic, more important services like the virtual machine service, or blob storage, load balancing, things like that. You generally think of as IaaS services. So then other teams at Microsoft tend to build on top of what we do to build higher level services. As you might expect, our data team builds our SQL Azure service, our Hadoop and Spark service, our new Postgres and MySQL services, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of these different services all built on top of, of Azure Core. So if you think of Azure Core as the bottom of the stack, then I like to say that I work at the top of the bottom of the stack. What I work on is developer experiences, how developers, including Microsoft Teams, building these internal things, as well as customers, use Azure in all these sorts of different ways. And that's everything from basic REST APIs, CLIs, SDKs, and how those are integrated into portals and IDEs and uh, a lot of other, other stuff. And if you th another of the projects that I work on is I work with the Linux vendors to make sure that Linux works great on Azure. So you may be surprised for me coming from Microsoft to find out that I actually sit on the Linux Foundation board. And then, of course, I work with DevOps partners like Chef for Chef Habitat, Inspec. Um, I work with Docker. I work with Kubernetes and Apache Mesos and a host of other projects. So I'm really in a very interesting place where I, at the intersection of Microsoft internal teams at the low level, higher level Microsoft teams, customers, partners, and open source communities. And I get to see some really interesting things about how the world uh, is changing. So to give you a, a little bit broader perspective, just realize we are in a time of incredible technological change. In fact, I like to say we literally live in a world of science fiction. So many things that we kind of take for granted now, just a few years ago, were things you only saw in Star Trek. So for example, we have electric cars. And as Barry mentioned yesterday, serverless cars are just around the corner serverless cars, self-driving cars, maybe serverless self-driving cars. <laughs> and we have private companies that are building spacecraft. We finally got to that Heinlein world where the, the pr private enterprise is starting to lead sp space exploration instead of just uh, government organizations. And machine learning and artificial intelligence in a relatively short span has gotten so good that we take it for granted that we can talk to our telephones and they'll talk back, or our television, or our thermostat. And that our computers and phones will recognize our faces and our fingerprints in order to log us in. So I was thinking about this about a year ago, and I thought, well, maybe the world's always been like this. It's been changing and it's just, you know, it don't have enough perspective. So I, I called my 88-year-old mother. And I asked her, Mom, in your lifetime, 
What is the biggest technological change that you have seen? Indoor plumbing. <laughs> Very pragmatic woman. It wasn't the answer I was expecting, but what she did go on to say was that next to that, the biggest change that she's seen was actually the smartphone. That her little old lady friends all have smartphones, and they use that to communicate, to coordinate what they're doing, to navigate, to get information. And if you just think about how many people are sitting here in the room right now looking at their little devices, you realize that this is just you know, changing our day-to-day -day behavior in the way that pretty much uh, no other technology has. And developers' lives are also changing at an incredible pace. We're in the cloud revolution, in one of these places like the smartphone revolution, or the web revolution, the PC revolution, where everything is changing at once, which requires developers to really uh, up their game on learning and understanding and figuring out what's going on. Because development teams are almost always maintaining some legacy system. Legacy being another word for the stuff that works. <laughs> as well as they've got actively developed projects that are based on newer technologies, things that were cutting edge five years ago, or two years ago, or last month. And they're still actively and changing, not maybe as fast as some of the other stuff, but they're still changing, because maybe they're moving those systems to the cloud, or they're adopting DevOps processes. And then finally, developers are also having to deal with these new emerging things, like containers and serverless systems, where the ecosystem really hasn't even developed. And, and it's really a challenge to figure out what's going on and how, how to go on it with it. So Microsoft really understands this, this development change. Uh, Barry mentioned the other day that every company on the planet is turning into a software company. I would actually say that we're an exception to that rule in a kind of an odd way in that, you know, we really started out as a developer company. Um, Microsoft, I would say, is a company by, for, and of developers. It was started by two developers. Actually, I think they called themselves programmers at the time, Bill Gates and Paul Allen, who were uh, building a product for programmers to build applications, Microsoft Basic. And our executive staff, all the way up to Satya, is full of people with a development background who think about developers and like developers. Our former CEO was not a developer himself. But he was famous for speaking very loudly and repeatedly <laughs> about how much he loved developers. And one thing we know, of course, is that developers love open source for a lot of reasons. I don't think I have to come to ChefConf and tell you all why DevOps and open source is a marriage made in heaven. The essential point is that open source allows projects and organizations to scale beyond what can be done by a single organization, even a big organization like Microsoft with a lot of development talent. Open source is a way for vendors, customers, practitioners to share best knowledge and practices about how to operate software and how to work with software. They're running in a lot of diverse different environments, the same systems, and that, uh, that knowledge can be contributed back upstream into the projects for the value of other people in the community. In fact, open source is an example of what Nassim Tlaib calls a anti-fragile system, a system that actually gets stronger under stress, under change, and even failure. And by the way, of course, there's no better example of all this than the Chef products, which actually take operational pr processes and procedures and knowledge, codify them to actual machine executables, and then share them back into open source. But this never really works unless you have strong, vibrant, diverse communities behind these uh, projects. And so, that's why you both users and vendors so value strong community cultures. And the best way for, to build one of these, these, these cultures and make sure it's strong and diverse is to contribute. So Microsoft, we've really been upping our involvement in a lot of different open source communities. 
individual projects as well as the big foundations like the Linux Foundation, the Apache Foundation, and the Open Compute Project. And in fact, we have over 15,000 developers at Microsoft with GitHub accounts that are contributing to open source projects. But this is... <laughs> but this is all just kind of statistics. So let's dive deep for a few minutes and talk about some real projects. How many people here use TypeScript? Okay, decent number. Uh, you may know Anders Heilsberg as the creator of Turbo Pascal and after that C Sharp. Anders' latest project is TypeScript. TypeScript is a type safe language. It's a superset of JavaScript, but it transpiles down into JavaScript, so it can run anywhere that JavaScript can without any additional runtime. And Anders is developing the entire project on GitHub in open source. He's taking pull requests. In fact, Anders is the number one contributor to the TypeScript project, and he does about 30 or 40 commits a month. How many of you use Visual Studio Code? Visual Studio Code is a lightweight code editor and IDE. It runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and it's a free download. It's used for pe by people doing Microsoft languages like F Sharp and TypeScript and C Sharp, but it's also used by people doing Node.js development, Angular development, and Golang. In fact, I talked a couple times recently to startups in the Valley that are all Golang shops, and they're entire development staff has switched over in the last year to using Visual Studio Code because they think it's the best IDE for Golang, even though these are shops that use almost nothing else from Microsoft. Well, Visual Studio Code is one of the fastest trending projects on GitHub, entirely developed uh, in open source, including um, a legendary Microsoft employee and developer named Eric Gamma, who some of you might know as one of the authors of the famous Gang of Four Design Patterns book. But Microsoft isn't contributing just to Microsoft projects. You probably all heard of Docker. The number four contributor to the Docker project all time is John Howard from the Windows team. And he's the number one contributor the last year or so. I can't mention Docker without making a short plug for one of my uh, personal projects, uh, Azure Container Service. Azure Container Service allows you to deploy and manage common open source container architectures like Apache Mesos, Kubernetes, and Docker Swarm on Azure. And yesterday, my friend and colleague David Justice gave a session about using Habitat on Kubernetes on Azure Container Service. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, uh, it happened yesterday, so you can't go see it, but check out the video replay. So the things I've talked about so far are developer products. We're a developer company. Maybe it's not so surprising that we're contributing to developer products. But are we using anything mission critical in open source? So let me tell you about Sonic. Sonic stands for Software for Open Networking in, cl in Cloud. I would have loved to be in the room where they came up with that name. Anyway, Sonic is software that manages hardware switches. Hardware switches, as you can imagine, in a data center are pretty important mission critical things. And the Sonic architecture componentizes all the different parts of the software that run a switch. Different protocols like BGP or SNMP, as well as monitoring, uh, telemetry, switch state, put them into Docker containers. And the whole thing runs on a physical switch running Linux. So, there's not much more mission critical in our cloud than the switches, and they're all running on Linux, and that entire software stack has been contributed to the Open Compute Project and is available on GitHub. We did that in order to create one of these communities between switch vendors, other network operators, and our own teams in order to improve software-defined networking uh, in Azure. And I haven't even mentioned so far what is probably the most famous open source project at Microsoft.net. .NET actually has a long history of open source. We 
first open sourced a version of .NET in about 2002. It came as a tarball targeting BSD. You could download it and untar it and, and play with the code. Not the great developer experience, but anyway, we, we started there. Now all .NET development, or virtually all .NET development, is done on GitHub in open source. And we did this thinking that we could take advantage of that community, get feedback from our customers and partners. And we were actually kind of stunned by how fast the community built up and started contributing very actively to the project. So just a couple of years in, over half the commits to the core CLR and core frameworks of .NET are coming from people outside of Microsoft. Two of the top four contributors to the core frameworks are external. And an example is, is very early on the project, Mac support, which is something we were planning to get around and work for, was contributed almost entirely by uh, the community. So even in a case of a big software project, one of the headline projects, with a talented and large Microsoft development staff working on it, we can see that community proves this point that no single organization can do as much as a large group of people. Now, I literally could give a lot of different other examples. I was just trying to get this talk together. I was trying to choose which stories to tell. But I don't have time to tell all these. Some of these have to be told uh, other days. I just want to leave you with that Microsoft is being transformed by open source. We are taking dependencies on open source for mission and critical products and services. We are encouraging our best developers to work in open source and to build communities around those projects. And so I'm very glad to have been here to tell you about, tell your community about this, and thank you for being part of our journey. John Gossman. Right? Come over here. Let's talk. Let us chat. Do you want this? Sure. I love the clicker. Obviously, I'm on stage all day. Clickers are my jam. Um, John, you've been at, you've been at Microsoft for, for a goodly while. 17 right? years. 17 years. Um, and that's long enough to have sort of remembered the moment where you were open, you know, Microsoft as an organization was sort of public enemy number one in open source land, right? Um, and I think the transformation that Microsoft has gone through from the outside, for me, is just stunning. Um, you know, you've gone from, from, from this reputation as being so anti-open source to being this organization that every time I go, it's this vibrant, like, active open source community, and it feels like every single person really feels it to their bones. What happened? <laughs> like, how did that, how'd that feel for you from the inside? Because, you know, when we talk about transformation, like, you know, as much as the enterprise is transforming and how difficult that is, like, that transformation at Microsoft must have been incredible. Yeah, no. And for me personally, it's just, like, the most fun thing I've ever done. It's just fascinating to see the energy that comes into the company in this way. Um, and the, the change comes from both ends, right? Um, obviously, especially almost any developer we hire under 30 has been used to developing on open source and using open source. So it's just natural. And at the same time, we have had, you know, very strong encouragement from Sacha Scott Guthrie, who came from the web world, has always been a big uh, champion of open source at Microsoft. And so when you get you know, top level buy-in and then grassroots from the developers themselves, it moves pretty quickly. It's not instantaneous, but if you think about it, if we just turned around and unleashed 15,000 developers and said, oh, go do open source, right. there'd be a few you know, missteps. Right, it would get weird. Yeah, very yeah, quickly, I, I think. think. Super fast, yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is great about the work you've done in Azure is that is that Azure Container Service, and thank you. Um, and there's a design there that I think you guys uh, thought through that uh, is is really interesting, which is that it's not just about Microsoft launching your own proprietary API for containers. Right. Instead, what you're doing is is sort of finding all of the leading vendors and then making that available to people. Um, what was that business decision like? How did you sort of think through that that was the right model? Because you, you mean you could have made other choices. You could have decided that you were going to build a, an Azure specific container API. Like why that open API? What was that? Well, one of the things we we noticed was that people who were going to Docker containers were actually seeking compatibility. They were saying this is a better way of distributing software and moving it around on-premise and, and under the cloud than uh, 
you know, what VMs had been even, even though VMs were fairly portable. So we thought anything we did that was non-standard and wasn't available everywhere was kind of defeating the purpose. And so, that, and then secondly, there's just been a lot of this orchestrated that have kind of been changing around. Starting to change a little more, you can see that there's a, a clear leader, but at the time, certainly, um, it wasn't clear wh wh where to go with that thing. And so we decided not to build our own, to use what the industry was to maintain compatibility, and then we just went out and partnered with all the, the leading vendors. I think it's super interesting because um, as, a, as an open source vendor um, and, and as someone who you know, tries to build a business on top of open source, one of the fears everybody has is that these, that these service providers that were, uh, are, are going to basically eat all of open source's lunch, you know, that there won't be any open source left because uh, those service providers do it. And I think that decision uh, really points a direction that says, look, it's, it's, it's possible to have these really tight partnerships that, uh, that are good for everybody, where the service provider is benefiting, the, the vendors are benefiting. I, mean, I think that's just, it was a, it was a yeah. remarkable decision. You were one of our very first um, open source partners on these things. I think we started with you about five years ago yeah. um, before some of these things even existed. And it's always been the goal to make, uh, you know, Microsoft, even when it was not an open source focused company, was known for building developer third party ecosystems. And we right. still want to do that. And that's, it's open source now. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to find best ways to partner and yeah, I think it's things. super interesting to, to think about that legendary Microsoft partner ecosystem as a thing that is now driving open source adoption and open source vendor movement. Like it's yeah. just such a, it's just an amazing business transition. Yeah, well, open source is the way most development is done now and it's just natural for us to get back in alignment with the way the rest of the community does, it does development. All right, so I'm gonna change, I'm gonna change gears just a little bit. Um, so when I was building Habitat, I think I might have told this story, but I'm gonna tell it again because I like it so much and I have you here and you're on stage and I can make you uncomfortable. Um, um, which, as we have noticed, is a theme for me at ChefConf this year. Um, Take your best shot. Thanks, man. Um, <laughs> still pals. Okay, so um, we, um, so I was building Habitat and I went to Microsoft and I, was, I, I, I tried to build it in front of people as much as I could. I wanted to show people what we were building so they could tell me whether I was in, going in a crazy direction, whether it was interesting. Um, and so uh, I had the pleasure of showing it to John and to some other folks at Microsoft. Um, in the early era of Habitat, um, we made that gossip layer and all of the intelligence uh, pluggable, right? We figured we would use um, etcd or Zookeeper or console or, or whatever um, to, to sort of handle that layer, um, which I thought was a good idea because everybody told me that A, distributed systems were really hard and, and they kind of are, and then B, that you shouldn't write your own cryptography. Um, and and it felt, they felt very similar to me, you know, it was like, don't build your own cryptography, and then it's cousin, don't build your own distributed system. And so I had showed this demo, and there was this minute in the demo where I thought it was really going well. You know, we were cranking along. It was, and it going was cool. Well. It was going good, right? And then I got to the coordination part, and I was like, okay, so here's the part where there's this secret cluster of coordination over here, and the applications do this magical thing. And, and I think the meeting got less good. You know, like, a, like it wasn't palpable, but there was, this mo there was this small little dip where it was like, ah. Um, and it was fine, and the meeting ended, and I got good feedback, and I think, if I remember right, you guys were like, that's cool, and like, we'd love to see it when it actually comes into the world, and hope that it's good, and we want to talk to you again. Um, and as we were walking to the car... Um, Quickly. Yeah. <laughs> right, because it, it had dipped, you know, so they were like, goodbye, crazy people. Um, John was like, so had you thought about why that integration with etcd and console? And I you know, said, well, because you know, you're not supposed to write your own distributed systems and you're not supposed to do your own cryptography. And he was like, well, I know, but like, I think that's gonna be a difficulty for your users. Like, it's, there's the thing that they'll have to overcome there that might be weird. And you should think about like, why don't you just do your own gossip protocol? Like, you should, you should just do that and then take care of it. And I was like, no, we probably shouldn't and people wouldn't adopt it. And, um, but it stuck in my head and I left and went to the car. And I think you actually said something like, and I think I said something like, I don't know that I'm smart enough to do that. And you were like, well, I don't know, Adam. Like, we, we have a lot of developers at Microsoft, and they've written gossip protocols, and I think, I think you could probably work it out. And then, like, shoved me out the door and sent me to my car in the rain. And, <laughs> um, and, and that sent me on, like, a six-month odyssey. So you'd have had Habitat six months earlier, but really crappier. Um, it wouldn't have had that gossip protocol if it hadn't been for John and that suggestion. And so let's give it up for John.
And so we've had this conversation a bunch of times that there's this, there's this protocol now that has grown up uh, from a bunch of other theories, so swim and newscast and a few other things. And it's sort of now getting to a stage where it's starting to become its own thing. And I was wondering, like, is it okay if we called that thing like the Gossman Protocol? Like, we could just do that, and then it could be an, an homage to your genius. So this is the project that delayed Habitat for six months. Yeah, for sure. No problem. And Barry, you still let me talk to him. Yeah, yeah. We get to be on stage. It's going to be a whole thing. Adam, I am so flattered that you were inspired by that comment. Because honestly, at the time, I don't think I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> well, it super worked. Well, I mean, that's part of the power of, of community and why diversity and, you know, even crazy ideas that probably came from reading something on Happy News that morning right. um, can turn out to be great success. So you've mentioned this several times to me, and I've right. been modest because I don't want to take credit for anything that really uh, I, I don't think I deserve credit for. But if it's inspired you that much, I'd be honored to have you name part of your architecture after me. Yay! All right, so that thing is the Gossman Protocol now. Uh, however. There is one caveat. OK. You need to spend an hour with me, go through the code. <laughs> Tell you how it works. So I know how it works. <laughs> oh, and, I'll, and, and when we write it down, I'll have a little note that says, this is named in honor of John Gossman, who gave us this awesome idea. He is not responsible for how bad this protocol is. Hey, if it's bad, <laughs> and somebody asks me about it, I can say, well, I gave Adam this great idea. I was, he, he was walking, and he screwed it up. it up. I was a genius. That <laughs> is actually if perfect. if it's good, yeah, and I don't do know that. how it will operate, that's really weird. That, yeah, it's going to be awesome. OK, well, thank you so much, John. I'm, right. I love thank having you. you here. Thank you.